Good afternoon. I, I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, today's seminar on ethical issues in organ transplantation. Uh, we're delighted and honored that Dick Thistlethwaite will present the talk today on a more equitable and efficient system for kidney allocation. Um, Dick and I go back uh, quite a way. Um, uh, we worked uh, uh, on, on some projects together in the 1980s. Um, uh, when when uh, Dick uh, performed the first uh, pancreatic transplant in Illinois and was a member of the team that performed the first liver transplant in Illinois. Uh, he also was a member of the team that did the first living donor uh, transplant uh, in, in the program here at the University of Chicago. Um, Dick is a professor of surgery, a professor in the Committee on Immunology, uh, who received his MD and PhD from Duke, and then did his residency and fellowship training at the Mass General and the NIH. Uh, Dick has performed more than 1,500 transplants, kidneys, pancreas, livers, um, and conducts research on T cell receptors and co-receptors to develop biological reagents that can prevent transplant rejection. He and I also worked together in, for six years in the Immune Tolerance Project, um, something that came out of the University of Chicago. Dick has had many uh, uh, positions of distinction. Uh, I'll just mention a few. He's been president of the International Pediatric Transplant Association um, and the Illinois Transplant Society, has been the board chair for the Regional Organ Bank of Illinois, and has served as a governor of the American College of Physicians. Please join me in welcoming Dick Thistlethwaite. That was American College of Surgeons. I don't qualify. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't, qual don't qualify for the food. It was just a minor slip of the tongue. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do is talk about a uh, in part at least about a uh, way of allocating uh, organs based on donor and recipient age that we call age mapping that uh, I've been very fortunate to work with Laney to develop. But a large part of the talk is going to be about sort of uh, about current uh, algorithms of uh, uh, allocation of disease donor kidneys. Uh, and. Uh, an attempt that's been ongoing for several years by UNOS to create new algorithms that will be more efficient. Uh, and I hope I can convince you that both equity and efficiency considerations are compatible, at least with age mapping, although I think somewhat questionable with uh, the proposals that have been made through the Kidney Transplant Committee of UNOS recently. Um, this is not just an ethics issue, it's an issue of law that the National Organ Transplant Act, uh, which is actually a law uh, passed by Congress, demands equitable access of patients to organ transplantation and equitable allocation of organs. So trying to figure out ways to ha get equal access is very important. Um, now, more recently, uh, by government regulation, federal regulation, not only has equitable allocation been restressed, but notice at the bottom in red, the issue of uh, proficiency, the best use of do or, uh, donated organs, has also been raised. And this has been really a decade-long struggle for UNOS, the group that oversees organ allocation in the United States, to try to come up with ways to do this. I might add that in different organs, this has been approached differently. How we do things in kidney is different from life-saving organs because of the alternative of dialysis. Uh, but still, uh, since we are talking about a shortage of organs, uh, an important way to figure out how to ration organs in the best possible fashion. Uh, my collaborators, uh, Laney I mentioned already, uh, Will Parker, who is a first-year intern in medicine here during an elective uh, period as a fourth-year student here, 
did a lot of the mathematical work of the model I'll show you. Bob Veach is an ethicist and a longtime friend of Laney's from Georgetown who helped us with the ethical considerations for age mapping. Summer Gentry is a mathematician, statistician, and modeler from the Naval Academy who I had heard give a talk uh, several years ago that I was impressed with and that Laney said, well, let's call her, and we got her involved without e ever having met her uh, to help Will with the uh, mathematical modeling. And then Ben Hippen is a nephrologist uh, from the uh, Carolinas Medical Center in uh, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, who actually, in, in the early part of the uh, project, worked with us and did a lot of the statistical analysis in terms of looking at the UNOS proposal and critiquing it. Well, if you haven't gotten, if you've gotten anything out of the seminar series, it's there aren't enough organs. <laughs> uh, and if there were, no one would argue about allocation at all. We'd all be happy and we'd be transplanting. And there wouldn't be federal laws or regulations governing transplantation. That is over and above what we're all facing now in the rest of medicine. But it's been a fact of life for us for a long time. Uh, this demonstrates graphically that the uh, waiting list keeps growing. The number of kidney transplants remains stagnant. And the only real point to make from this is actually how good the nephrologists are of keeping people with renal failure alive now. Because despite the increasing disparity, you notice the death rate on dialysis has not changed. Well, just some general things. There are multiple approaches to trying to increase the supply of organ donors. Uh, Non-heart beating donors now, which we refer to as DCD, uh, these are people that don't quite meet brain death criteria, but whose families have determined they want to withdraw active treatment uh, for supportive care. Uh, now make up about 10% uh, of all organ donors. Excuse me, uh, yes, 10% uh, of all organ donors. Um, in this hospital, I want to mention that uh, Tracy Kugler was instrumental in developing our DCD policy. Uh, here, first person consent remains controversial. If you sign uh, and get on a registry in your state for to be an organ donor, that now legally takes precedent over the wishes of your families after your death. It's a mixed blessing. Yes, we can force one more donor, but to the news uh, media loves to publicize these events, which probably then prevents several more people and families from donating. Presumed consent is more of a European model, which is an opt-out. In other words, you're presumed to be a donor unless you have stated beforehand you don't want to be. And in Spain, where it's most successful, it's combined with actually having, in each hospital in Spain, a paid employee whose job is to identify donors and help uh, have uh, potential donors actually become donors. Spain, because of this, is the most successful country in the world in terms of donors per million, with about 45 donors per million population. The U.S. is somewhere around 30. So, in other words, they do about 50% better than we do. Something that actually just this week was introduced as a bill to Congress is the uh, to try to reverse a law which prevents HIV positive people from being organ donors. Uh, the concept here would be to allow HIV positive donors to give to HIV positive recipients, which now at least for our program is about 5% of our kidney transplants are in HIV positive patients. So this would again increase the availability of organs for everyone. I think it's conceivable with the uh, improved retrovirals, by the way, that in the future uh, this, uh, you could envision giving HIV positive organs to individuals who were HIV negative and treating them uh, prophylactically. And that probably even today would work. I think intellectually and emotionally it's probably not an acceptable thing right now, but theoretically it could be. Uh, and in fact, as I talk some about older donors, uh, 
I suspect a lot, and older recipients, I suspect a lot of older recipients would do better with that sort of donor uh, from a young person than with an old donor uh, uh, because of the uh, efficacy of current treatment. Uh, economic incentives. Uh, I might mention that Frank Delmonico, the keynote speaker of this series, about 10 years ago proposed that there be a, a donation made to families of deceased donors for funeral expenses uh, as a thank you. In other words, as a payment. <laughs> Didn't go very far. Uh, and finally, uh, Laney has mentioned the possibility of revising the brain death criteria to that of cortical brain activity. I'm not sure how many new donors this would bring because this would just convert what we now do as DCD donors basically into a, a redefined brain death donor status. Uh, living donors, uh, although it's still a very small number, uh, the non-directed donor, altruistic donor, has become increasingly a donor source. And as we heard um, Garrett Hill talk about in his business model of uh, donor chains earlier in the series, can be magnified many times over in terms of one donation starting a whole chain of exchanging of donors uh, among living donors who are incompatible with their emotionally re related recipient. And finally, the whole, the, the big uh, elephant in this refrigerator is the idea of paying for donors themselves. Uh, it's a very emotional argument uh, on both sides. Those four can see how we would have enough donors uh, to, uh, to transplant everyone needed, at least for kidneys. I don't think we're talking about heart donors here or lung donors, but, uh, uh, and note that we, do have hazard pay for several other risky things that we allow individuals to undertake. Those opposed to it talk about the uh, privilege preying on the underprivileged because certainly the people who would volunteer to give up their organs for money for the amounts of money likely to be offered at least because I suspect we all have our price but the price that would probably be given would be those of the poor. Uh, just as a side, Laney now has a Journal Book Club, I guess, that has met twice, uh, trying to look into the underpinnings of payment and the possibility of this, or the ethics of why it shouldn't be done, uh, the, to try to get a more reasoned approach than what we've heard publicly. Uh, I'm going to probably skip this slide, because I have a lot of slides other than the very bottom, which says actually, and it was what we're going to talk about, is one of the ways to help, not resolve, but help with the organ donor shortage is to change the al allocation algorithm to favor optimal candidates. And I think this slide, this next slide will help you understand that. If you look at the most frequent cause of failure of kidney transplants, and this comes from an article very good article actually out of the Mayo Clinic where they had biopsy data on failing kidneys. Uh, but you can see by far and away the most common cause of a kidney, of a kidney failure is death with a functional kidney. That means that the kidney could have worked longer. Now I can quibble with some of their percentages. They have a different patient population than us and they take different risks because we don't have 11 or 12 percent of our patients have no f primary non-function with disease donor kidney transplants. I think we would find that unacceptable. And I believe if I ask Michelle, who oversees our transplant follow-up, Michelle Josephson, I believe we probably have more than 11% of our patients with chronic rejection also. So there are some differences in populations and how you approach. But the astounding factor is that a lot of kidneys go into the ground, into the grave, that could still be working for someone else if they were put into a a more appropriately matched uh, recipient. Uh, let's just review kidney uh, allocation now. Since 2002, there have been two types of donors, primarily uh, standard criteria donors, that's the majority, and about 16% of donors called extended criteria donors. That's all donors greater than 60 year old or greater than 50 with the caveats noted. 
It requires an opt-in by signing consent to get a, uh, a uh, expanded criteria donor. Um, this is because statistically, and they were chosen as an expanded criteria donor, they have a relative risk of graft failure at least 1.7 times that of an ideal donor. Now, the, that statistic is not limited to expanded criteria donors. If you look at standard criteria donors, about 30% of them also hit that level of a relative risk of graft loss of 1.7%. But virtually all expanded criteria donors hit that and have that risk or higher. The distribution algorithm, which is the baseline from which we'll move, is a point system where waiting time is the most important gets you the most points. The longer you waited, the more likely you are to be offered a transplant. Queuing, waiting, is an equity way of doing it. Everybody gets their chance. You get in line and you take your chance of getting to the end of the line and getting a transplant. There are some points given for efficacy, and that's HLA matching primarily. That used to be a big deal. As immunosuppression has gotten better, it's not nearly as much of a deal as it is now. In fact, only HLA-DR matching, not A, B, or DQ, DP, or others are, are used in the algorithm. Uh, and also, and this is probably a good thing, within each category, there is there's varying quality. So when I get offered a kidney in the middle of the night, it may be a standard criteria donor kidney from a 20-year-old who has no comorbidities other than having been in a traumatic accident. Or it may be from a 65-year-old who's had a stroke, had hypertension, may have diabetes. So there is a varying quality. And that, again, is sort of a lottery, uh, which is another equity measure. But equity drives pretty much the current system uh, rather than efficiency. So in 2011, the Kidney Committee, KTC Kidney Transplant Committee of UNOS, uh, presented a concept paper with a proposal to totally change how we distribute kidneys. So first, the top 20% of kidneys by what's called a, a kidney donor profile index, and I'll explain these terms, uh, would be given to the top 20% of recipients best uh, 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 as uh, determined by their estimated post-transplant survival. So just take the best and give to the best, in other words, off the top. This remaining 80% of kidneys would be distributed by age matching with a range on either side of 15 years, uh, which would give younger kidneys to younger recipients and hopefully uh, improve efficiency. Uh, so this raised the two questions because it's a two different schemes really, side by side. Is giving the best kidney to the best candidate ethically justifiable? And is giving the younger kidneys to younger donors ethically justifiable? Uh, this is a, each of these is a question in two parts because one is a general question and the other is looking at the specific criteria that UNO you know, set to, to try to incorporate these. Now for me, I have trouble with the first one. Best to best is not sort of a, how we do medicine. It's sort of the neediest first. Uh, the second, I would argue that in theory, there is not a problem with giving younger kidneys to younger recipients. Indeed, that's the age mapping proposal that I'll, I'll talk to you about. Um, it makes it easier because I think the specifics of how UNO has done each of these, or proposed to do each of these, is flawed. So let's talk about longevity matching. The kidney donor profile index is to be an estimate of donor kidney, not uh, survival, not the recipient survival in terms of longevity, but just the kidney survival, has 10 different factors that are only donor based. And you can argue with the individual factors. But if you plot the uh, relative risk of graft failure, 
versus the percentile by this KDPI index, and it's an index over 100%. So if someone's at 80%, it means 80% of the kidneys, or kidneys at 80%, 80% of the kidneys are, are estimated to perform better, or predicted to perform better than that kidney. Now you can see the real problem of this, as far as I'm concerned, is actually out at the tail, where the, uh, among the worst kidneys, and you can read from that the kidneys that older people are going to get, meaning people like me. <laughs> and what they want to do is limit at least distribution to the bottom 20%, best to best. Uh, but since the KDPI, we, we'll talk a little bit about the upper end as we move along as well. Now, the estimated post-transplant survival is only based on four factors, age, time of dialysis, prior transplant, and diabetes, and obviously each of these factors make post-transplant survival worse. And we'll talk about that as well. Uh, now, if you look at this in terms of median estimated post-transplant lifespan, you can see that indeed some kidneys are excuse me, some, some kidneys are estimated to work much better. I would argue that the top 10% is, looks different than the top 20% because the second uh, uh, decile, it looks pretty much on a linear uh, curve with the others. Uh, the justification given, interesting, and this is, uh, this is actually a quote, is the reason they, the, the top 20% was selected was for no other reason that it was determined to be the most discernibly different from the rest of the kidneys. And I think, as we'll talk about, that is an issue. A uh, busy slide I've just talked about, the arbitrary dichotomous division between 20 and 80 percent is having no justification ethically about why the, it is at 20 percent having virtually no uh, justification. Uh, other reasons is methodologically the statistical evaluation is lacking. This is a test to remember to determine who gets a kidney. So a medical test that can pick out the top quintile from the bottom quintile but not people in two successive quintiles. So in other words, you're going to treat similar people differently based on a measure that cannot make that distinction. Uh, I put this bottom uh, paraphrase actually here, because Alan Lightman, who talked to us a few weeks ago, was a member of the group that helped develop the precursors for, for both EPTS and KDPI, uh, and is an author on this critique, stating essentially what I have already. So one of the things that I wanted to point out about the upper end of that curve is that KDPI is calculated without consideration for candidate factors that decrease graft survival. From the earlier slide where I talked about death with a functioning kidney, which is what we're trying to overcome, that's mostly older people who basically their kidney could outlive them. That's a recipient factor. So this formula that ignores that makes it look like the worst kidneys which by our current system, which is where this is modeled from, meaning the uh, ex expanded criteria donor kidneys, are the ones that fit into that category. And we're dinging them e even excessively by the formula because we don't take into account that many of those kidneys would actually last longer if put into people who would live longer. Uh, and I think I showed that slide again. Uh, one to concentrate up here that certainly it is going to keep going up, but I don't think it's going to go up so expeditiously. What's the difference? Try convincing a kidney recipient they want one of these kidneys. And we're going to discard kidneys because of the way we're presenting the data to them, and I don't think adequately analyzing it for the patients. Uh, the bottom point, even the kidney committee of UNOS admits that they have not really vetted or validated the uh, estimated post-transplant survival. This is their quote. Uh, and I think, again, 
having ideas, presenting them is great, but not saying this is how we want to distribute kidneys when it's not actually been a validated measure. Diabetes, remember one of the four things that go into estimated post-transplant survival. How can you pick the most prevalent disease that causes kidney failure and make that as a discriminating factor? Uh, it actually isn't. The discriminating factor is cardiovascular disease. That's what causes people to die before while well, their kidney is still working, not diabetes. Yes, diabetes have a lot of cardiovascular disease, but so do other people. The problem is that UNOS doesn't collect data on cardiovascular disease to be able to use it as a discriminating factor, and this is the closest they get, so that they will pick to discriminate against a disease, people with a certain disease, in order to try to have it as a surrogate for another model. Because uh, the diabetes, if you look at the multiplication factors, it's not just 25% of its time on dialysis and 25% of its age, et cetera. Age and diabetes are the two strongest di drivers of EPTS, and it will disqualify even young diabetics from being in that top 20%. It will also, along with the age, plus minus 15 age discrimination, when they looked at what's going to happen to various diseases and who will get transplants, diabetes is the only disease among the major diseases that cause kidney failure that will be discriminated. That's because it's primarily type 2 diabetes, which far outnumbers type 1, is primarily an older population. So that's as much age matching it as it is the 20%. Now, they really unfortunate thing is that they have chosen in this to look at survival from time of transplant. If you look at earlier data that looked at survival from time of starting dialysis, of development of end-stage renal disease, transplant makes a tremendous difference to people with diabetes. If you look at lifespan from listing with no transplant, these are people who are highly sensitized, have a hard time getting a recipient. You can see that in th young people, their time that they would live just on dialysis is less than half of that of someone who doesn't have diabetes. It's reduced in middle-aged people and really uh, only starts to almost uh, become the same in old people, but still a decrease. If you look at life years gained with transplant, it's the diabetics who gain more life years with transplant. Uh, again, until you get to the very old, uh, so that it's actually imperative that we try to get diabetics transplanted because they benefit so much from it. And this is totally ignored by simply looking at time from transplant rather than the time of development of renal disease. The final thing that's just, I think, probably for Laney more than anything else, is they actually present this data in their proposal, and that is the improvement of their hybrid proposal over baseline, meaning what the current uh, way kidneys are distributed. There are life years gained, there's no doubt about that, uh, compared to baseline. But if you look on a per patient basis, relatively small gains. If you look at lifespan benefit, of transplant versus dialysis, for example, it's a half year that's gained. That would be 5.4 versus 4.9. But the most amazing thing is if you said, let's do away with this 20% of giving best to best because of all the concerns I mentioned and just did age matching, you would see absolutely no difference. And if you compare those two columns, you can see there's virtually no difference between the two. So in, in the concept proposal, the justification they, they, having presented this data that they gave for the hybrid proposal was that it gave them increased flexibility. Now, I don't know what that means, uh, but that was the only stated uh, benefit, and, and actually there is none. So let's talk about age matching. I can trash that too. <laughs> uh, if you are going to age match, you have to consider what are the age distributions of your donors and recipients. 
because if, and, and actually the, one of the first papers Mark and I worked on had to do with age matching of liver, trans, pediatric liver transplant recipients and brain death donors of pediatric age. And there was a great mismatch. Here there's a great mismatch also. If you look at donors, first thing I want to point out is that this is not the number of donors. This is 10 times the number of donors. So when you see this peak at 3,000 and this one almost at 3,000, think of it actually being down here at 300, OK? So in other words, there are far more recipients than donors. But in order to show the peaks, and there are actually three, there's a small peak, due to, unfortunately, due to infant death. There is a large peak due to trauma among young people. And there's a large peak due to cerebral vascular accidents among old people. Now, obviously, 50 is not the, and I'm looking from the side, is not the peak of that disease. Uh, but there tend to be core morbidities in people with cerebral vascular accidents from older age that make them disqualify them as donors. Both these peaks are younger than the peak of recipients. So if you did strict age matching year for year here, and you were, say, 20 years old, you'd have enough donors, so because this is really, remember, th 300, not 3,000, you'd have about the same number each year of 20-year-olds who needed transplants and, and donors who were 20 years old. If you go out, let's say, to 65, where donors here that read 500, would be really 50, and you, by comparison, have 2,000 recipients vying for those 50 transplants, so very inequitable. Hence the plus minus 15 years to try to smooth that out. It doesn't really smooth it out, however, because even with the plus minus 15 years, if you look at the number of uh, transplants per the number of candidates, and these age ranges were chosen by UNOS, and we'll continue to use those further so we can do comparisons. It looks like the youngest age range, the 1830 to 34-year-old candidate, would have an over three times chance of getting transplanted than someone who is in the highest age range of over 65. So this is just age discrimination. So not only is it because of the mismatch in ages of donors and recipients, uh, preferentially giving more kidneys to younger as age discrimination, but there's another unintended consequence here. And I, I bring these up because Laney loves unintended consequences. And that, that is that if you give fewer kidneys to older people, their waits will be longer. These are the people who are most likely to die while waiting and therefore you're going to increase your death on the waste list, that statistic that's remained relatively stable for a long time. So this is not a good uh, thing to do. Now in the public comment period, which the way UNIS does is they put out these proposals, they allow public comment. In the public comment period, uh, the Office of General Counsel and the Office of Civil Rights of HHS commented and you can read their comments saying this is, uh, does not meet with the requirements of the Age Discrimination Act of 1979 uh, and likely to bring lawsuits. And that killed this proposal. I'm sure they didn't listen to Laney and my comments, but they uh, listened to, to uh, the government's. The government gave them an out and actually stated that stipulations in the Age Discrimination Act allow that age can be employed if it's used as a proxy for medical variables. It was like a lifeline being thrown out to them. Uh, they didn't take it, uh, but nonetheless it was there. Well, Lainey and I looked at this, and as you can see, I've been very critical. If she were giving this talk, I think it'd probably be up a notch or two. <laughs> Uh, it's easy to pick out flaws in other people's ideas. It's much harder to be constructive about how you might be able to help them improve on it. And we looked at the two parts of the proposal and neither of us saw a way that we could clearly ethically justify best to best. People may agree with that. Certainly the creators of that algorithm 
disagree with that, but at least with our feet being soundly based in equity, that didn't seem to be the right thing. So we asked each other, and both of us sort of came up with this idea at the same time, what can we do? Because age is very appealing. Number one, as I say here, we all age. It's something that happens to everybody. It's not taking diabetics versus non-diabetics. Tomorrow, we're all gonna be a day older. But two, and we had realized this actually and begun a, an opinion piece. Actually, we were on about its 20th version by the time the, uh, the uh, government uh, statement came out. Uh, that it is a good surrogate for both donor grass survival and candidate lifespan. And it should, even though I don't think I had any idea what was in the Age Discrimination Act of 1979, it should meet those requirements. So this is actually a graft of hazard ratio of donor age and graft survival in the paper that first proposed the precursor to KDPI. And they even admitted in that paper, uh, and this is again uh, the, the Michigan group, uh, that there was a great relationship. Indeed, you saw from about 10 to 40 or 10 to 35 years of age uh, that there was uh, about the same hazard ratio. There wasn't a difference. But above that, almost a linear relationship with age and the uh, than the graft survival of that transplant when it was transplanted. Lainey presented this slide two weeks ago, and I presented it only because she couldn't find the 18 to 34 year old donors. I, uh, I don't know if you remember that, but she was searching around for this dotted purple line. And the reason she couldn't find it is it's because it's hidden by the solid purple line which is the 10 to 17 year old donors. There's just no difference in survival when you plot it out. This was 10 years of the UNOS database that we plotted out ourselves. Successively older groups of donors have successively worse survival, much consistent with the hazards ratio that I just showed you. Uh, but it really is equivalent, a donor who's 18 uh, and a don up to 34, it's, even if you plot them out by smaller increments, there's very little change, as the hazard ratios would suggest. Um, UNOS actually looked at age as a similar variable and compared it to KDPI. Forget the kids, they did this wrong. They're mo this is all modeled, remember, so if you don't have a good model, their model doesn't work for children. And indeed, one of the things as Will has subsequently done is gone and looked at kids, and with more granularity, you can pick out even some people from donors from zero to four years of age that if you do dual transplants or in-block transplants, do just as well as the 11 to 35-year-old. But look at the adults, and you can see, again, there's a linear relationship between donor quality as measured by their KDPI and age itself so that KDPI adds very little to age. Now they want us to see that there's a substantial overlap as a negative advantage. I see it as a positive advantage. And again, I go back to my statement. We want to treat similar people in a similar fashion. And by having that wiggle room, and I think they didn't describe it, but I believe these are, uh, the lines are outliers, the bars are probably 70 and 25th percentile, and the middle line is median. By having that variation in quality, it makes one group closer to the next, and so there's not as much discrimination because of that sort of lottery effect that we even talked about earlier with the current system. What about lifetime? This is a, another slide from UNOS. They shoot themselves in the foot a lot. Uh, and that is looking at ex uh, expected remaining lifetimes from people starting dialysis, from people getting transplanted, and age match normal controls. Now I want to focus primarily on the green line, obviously, to again point out that there, with age there is a incremental decrement in lifespan. So this is the EPTS, which age is a good surrogate for. This is not all that accurate for comparison, because this is all people on dialysis. Not all people on dialysis are healthy enough to get a transplant. So it's not a good comparator. 
but it does worse, obviously. And again, the focus for patients is when I show them this graph, they're not going to be as good as if they had their own kidneys working normally for them. But still, age is a good surrogate for outcome in terms of post-transplant survival. So the development of age mapping for us was really a two-step process. The first was to create an ethical framework that would say that it's okay to use age as a discriminating factor without it being discriminating, to use the word two different ways. And the second, when Will came as a fourth year student during his elective period to work with us with a lot of math, uh, mathematical expertise that we claimed we had forgotten but probably actually never really had, we were able to uh, actually generate a model for this. Uh, perhaps it should say oversimplified rather than simplified there. Uh, so, one of the things you have to know about Lainey is when she gets into something, she takes a mini sabbatical. So one weekend, Lainey came to me and said, I need to read about rationing of scarce resources. And I have this mental image of her locking herself up in a room at home and ignoring her kids and her husband and, <laughs> and, and, and reading about rationing of scarce medical resources. One of the th things she came back with after that weekend was this article by Prasad et al. Uh, which was essentially about how you allocate scarce medical resources, not necessarily transplant organs, although that was one of the examples he used. And although I didn't agree with all the principles he enumerated, I think this statement is very true. To achieve just allocation of scarce medical interventions, society must embrace the challenges of implementing coherent multi framework rather than relying on simple principles or retreating into the status quo. We do a lot of retreating into the status quo, I think. If you look at the argument about kidney uh, allocation, there are those who want better efficacy, and there are those who want to maintain equity. And if you're going to just use those two principles, you're never going to get any place. So we said, OK, we, we like this, and we're going to run with it. So the way we ran with it is, of course, equity-based because that's where we come from. And we set as our first principle that we needed to maintain, as, as demanded by NOTA, equitable access and equitable allocation, which is really equal opportunity. And what does equal opportunity do? It respects the worth, importance, and dignity of all individuals. So if you're going to have a first principle, that's not a bad one to start with. In terms of transplant, of course, that means everybody should have an equal chance of getting a transplant. That's mandated by law. Uh, but mathematically, we could express that. And we already started to do that when we were looking at the number of transplants per candidate age group. But rather than letting that fluctuate, we said what we ought to do as first principle is set that at a constant value. So whether you're 65 or whether you're 20, you have an equal chance of getting a transplant. And I had to include this last line because it's philosophy speak that I don't understand. That, it, that means it lexically constrains subsequent principles, which might justify age mapping. There's nothing about dictionaries in this, so I just don't understand that. So on the first principle also that helps us out, I don't, oh, so here's the mathematical, or the graph of what this would be mathematically. Rather than having different numbers of kidneys given to different age groups, we'd start from the premise that we had to have each age group get exactly the same number of kidneys. The ratio number there is not important. That just happened to be what it was in 2010. 2011 is actually 0 0.9 because we get more people on the list and don't have any more transplants. But it's across the board. Everybody has the same chance. Uh, so the first or the second principle we used in our step two is called prudential lifespan. Also philosophy speak because it has nothing to do with prudence. Uh, but what it is is that a principle, at least applied to medicine, that treating all persons the same over the lifespan is uh, equitable. Not that people need to be treated the same throughout their lifespan, but equal to other people at the same stage of life. We do this all the time. You don't get your driver's license until you're 16. We set an age at which you can vote. 
we set an age at which you can qualify for Social Security. It might change. In fact, some of the previous ones have changed. But, uh, but everybody's treated the same at the stage of their life. So this justifies giving older kidneys to older candidates. Now, I look at this a little bit differently. And again, I'll use myself as an example. I'm in my 60s. I had good kidneys when I was in my 20s. I had good kidneys when I was in my 30s and 40s and 50s. Thank goodness I still have good kidneys now. But if I didn't, would I have the same claim on a 20-year-old kidney as someone who developed kidney failure at 18 and never had good kidneys when they were 20, never got that chance that I've already had and enjoyed? And that, to me, is what prudential lifespan equity means. Now, on the other end of this, is a principle of fair innings, which Bob Veach, our collaborator, championed. Uh, you know, I'm a South Sider. I like the Watts, White Sox. I know what an inning is. But this, this is not a baseball inning. This is actually a cricket inning, which I know less about. <laughs> but I assume everybody has to have the same number of innings when you play cricket. You get your fair innings. But as a principle, Harris defines this as an equity principle that each person should be given an equal chance of a reasonable length of life. And derived from that, it directs health resources preferentially to those who are worst off by means of being furthest from obtaining this normal lifespan. Applied to kidney transplantation, it uh, uses being a younger candidate as proxy for medically worse off. Think back to the Discrimination Act. This is sort of the phraseology they use also, the same that Harris used, in the sense of having fewer healthy life years and less chance of reaching a normal lifespan. And it justifies giving younger kidneys using younger kidneys as a proxy for better kidneys, as I've shown uh, graphically on a, on a couple of graphs previously. Therefore, it seems to us that it would be very consistent with the requirements of the Age Discrimination Act. So our conclusion from the ethical portion of this is that using age and allocation of disease donor kidneys is, is ethically permissible and does not constitute discrimination. What's wrong is discriminating by limiting equal access to transplant for all patients, as originally stated in NOTA. Now Will comes in. And Summer Gentry comes in, because we were trying to push Will to do this great continuous variable thing that everybody would proportionally this and that. And he was getting frustrated with us. And we actually had a conference called Summer Gentry, and she has simply said, keep it simple, stupid, although she said it much more nicely than that. Uh, and the, she said, you can achieve the same thing as a prototype by simply setting up age group, candidate age groups, and donor age ranges. And if you want to keep the proportion constant, you can do that. So you will have an allotment of the, let's say, the um, 18 to 34-year-old kidneys, the optimal kidneys. <coughs> and you will allot a certain proportion of those, because they're, again, they're disproportionate. Younger kidneys are disproportionately, in a ratio fashion, uh, plentiful, even though numerically they're not, uh, for younger donors. Now, we didn't know how to treat the kids, so we used the literature at the time that said kidneys from 0 to 10-year-olds actually perform about like a 50-year-old kidney, so we placed them in the 50-year-old pot, but that's neither here nor there. That can be done better. And what we did is we started and we said, OK, we'll take all the young kidneys and our youngest candidate age group range we set at 18 to 34 because we knew those had essentially the same performance. And we put a proportion of those into the youngest recipient group or the candidate group up to the quota that they would get. And then when those left over, we put in the next group. And by doing that successively, we created an allotment, ma allotment matrix, which is here. So if you look at the donor ages, only to, f to provide the appropriate allotment for the 18 to 34 year old only takes 30% of the 18, 11 to 34-year-old kidneys. So the other 70% goes to the next recipient age, candidate age group. Uh, that uh, pretty much fills that up, 94%, but you need some more. So 6% out 
out of the next age group also goes that, and that fills that allotment up. So most of the 35 to 49-year-old kidneys actually go to the 50 to 64 age group. So how does this work with this work in real time? You would take a donor kidney, and let's take a 20-year-old as an example, and that, that would fit in the youngest, or the optimal age range, 11 to 34. And then it's allocated to a weighted probability of 29.29% going to the youngest age range and 71% going to the, to the next youngest candidate age range. And you just work that on through, basically. So how does that end up distributing kidneys? If you look over here, the answer is by mapping, not matching ages, you actually do very well because you give most people a kidney younger than their age. So that you look at the 18 to 34 year old, 18 to 34 year olds, they're all going to receive kidneys from the 11 to 34 year old group. And as I said, if you do this on a percent basis, remember there are a lot more people 50 to 64 a year needing kidneys, but on a percent, this is totally filled up. This is 94% filled up, and you only need 4% of the kidneys to come from the 35, or 6% to come from the 35 to 49 age range on up. If you look at the 50 to 64 year olds, uh, most of our kidneys are going to come uh, from the 35 to 49 year old age range. In other words, still younger than I am. Uh, that we put the pediatric kidneys here. A few are going to get age-matched kidneys, 50 to 59-year-olds. And even in the plus 65-year-olds, half come from 50 to 59-year-olds, younger than they are, half from 60-plus. Now, I could go back to the graph of the age distribution of donors, but most of these 60-plus are actually less than 65, because as you go over 65, they're fewer and fewer. So this is actually an equitable way of giving younger kidneys to younger recipients by mapping rather than matching. Just look at the baseline system and its lack of efficacy because you have younger kidneys going to older recipients, but about a quarter of them, 20-year-old kidneys, 30-year-old kidneys. You have older kidneys, 50, 59-year-olds, still going to even the younger recipients. Because this was a time period when we were doing the SCD, ECD, the expanded, excuse me, extended criteria donors, most of the older kidneys above 60 ended up with, with older recipients. But that's a function of how kidneys are distributed currently. Uh, so how did UNOS respond to this? Uh, the uh, Office of Civil Rights. As I said, Lainey and I had already started our work on this, but we certainly, uh, let me put it in a first person. I certainly felt vindicated by the government, probably the only time <laughs> that I can remember. Uh, I suspect she did also, that they actually thought that it was as discriminatory as we did. Well, UNOS responded not by taking their hint, but by saying, okay, we're not going to do age matching or age allocation in any form. Instead, they devised and presented in September a new uh, protocol which would maintain the top 20% into the top 20% by giving them preference. But what it also did, and which also I think is the main reason for the benefits that I'll show you, is they gave the top 20% recipients equal access to all other kidneys. Now, I don't think they'd want equal access to a 90% KDPI kidney, but I think they would want access to that 20 to 35 or maybe 20 to 40 percent kidney. But what that does is by allowing them to double dip, and this is all modeled by a UNOS model that is not freely available to the rest of us, is it still gives a preference to younger donors in terms of the numbers of kidneys, the ratio of their chance of getting a kidney. And I think it derives most of its benefit from that factor and not by the 20% into 20%. Uh, this is a more refined picture, uh, a larger database, so to speak, of, of looking in, in 2012 rather than 2011 of estimated uh, graft survival by KDPI. You can notice a couple things. Indeed, 
as your KDPI index gets higher, it gets lower and there's still this drop off at the end. This is one year survival. This is two year survival and clearly there's a decrement over time which we all know. That's magnified with the poorer grade kidneys. But if you look and they also provided us a table and I wanted to specifically compare with the question of what is a top 20% recipient going to take? If they take a 10% kidney, it's one year survival is 93%. That's only 1.5% better. If they got offered a 30% kidney, I would advise them to take it first. That would be their choice. And if you look even at it five years, the difference between a 10% and a 30% kidney is projected to be only 4%. Now, not every 10% kidney necessarily is better than a 30% kidney because there are factors that don't go into KDPI that affect graft survival that we know about, but they are not that frequently involved. But for example, if someone had bad DIC from a gunshot wound to the head and had microthrombi in their kidney, that might, kidney might still qualify as a 10% kidney by other things, but it might not be as good as a 30% kidney. So with the overlaps here, I would have no problem saying to someone, you're offered a kidney with a KDPI of 30%, you could wait and get perhaps a better one, but I think you ought to take this kidney now because by waiting, even someone in their 20s has a 2 to 3% chance of dying within the next year of complication of their renal failure. So it's not without risk to wait longer. Uh, here, here is the outcome based on the baseline versus the, their new proposal. And notice that the advantage gained is cut extensively. If you look, for example, just lifespan, lifespan benefit, uh, transplant versus dialysis, a quarter year is all that is gained now with the new proposal. So I maintain they need to go back to the drawing board once again. Whether they will or not, I don't know. And finally, my conclusions, age mapping doesn't raise ethical issues that still exist in the new proposal. It's likely that age mapping would produce better results in the current proposal. Remember, the current proposal only t affects the top 20 percent, uh, not everybody, and age mapping does affect everybody uh, in, in all the outcome measurements that they have looked at. And when we presented this to the Kidney Transplant Committee, our proposal, this summer and ask them to at least run it or a form of it in, in their model, modeling system, to be able to see how much benefit it gave. Their response was basically they wanted to wait and see what the UNIS board uh, decided about their new proposal, which will happen in a meeting this June. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. So um, I think that to me, the, the crux of the argument uh, and the proposal that you make is, is that um, the chance of getting a kidney is equal across all ages. Yes. Right? Um, and I don't know where that lands ethically, but um, as I was sitting there and I was thinking, okay, my son is 23 or whatever, four, if both he and I had kidney failure, and we both needed a kidney, therefore, I'd want him to have a higher chance of getting that kidney than me. And I don't know where that lands in terms of eth ethics, uh, and I suspect that it doesn't um, work with the equitable things that the NODA and all that stuff in the final rule, sa rule says, but to me it just seems right that my son would get, have a better chance of getting a kidney than I would. Would he say the same? Yes. You don't think he'd say? He, uh, I don't believe so. I believe he'd say. I believe he'd say that you ought to have an equal chance with him. Twenty-year-olds. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 I believe he ought to have a chance at a better kidney. I'm not sure he should have a chance of. No, you, you, you're, you should. You, you're saying he should have an equal chance of a better kidney. Yes. And that's not only legally correct as far as I'm concerned, but I also think eth ethically correct. You're valuing his lifespan differently than you, and you personalize it, and it's very hard when we do with our kids. But when I am talking to a 60-year-old 
who's on dialysis, not to tolerating dialysis, life is miserable. I believe that person values whatever, five or seven years he'll get out of a kidney transplant, perhaps more than a 20-year-old who won't take his medicines and lose it, okay? So that it's very hard to project our own feelings on others. And I think that, honestly, I think people have an equal claim to getting a transplant, which is exactly what Notith was all about to start with. But, but I, really, I really resent the fact that we are now giving 20-year-old kidneys to 65-year-old recipients. And, and that's, that's what we're trying to correct. I, I, I agree that that's not right. Uh, it's just the chance issue. Dick, um, you showed us NOTA, and then you showed us the final rule. And the final rule said that the equitable allocation of cadaveric organs should be added to the best use of the donated organ. And you indicated that you and Laney, um, for ethical reasons, uh, elected to go with the equitable allocation of the cadaveric organ a as your starting point, let's say, rather than the best use of the donated organ. Um, as someone who trained for a while in England, where you remember they had that informal convention, n never a rule, never written down, that organs would not go to people above the age of 55. You're showing your age mark. What, yes. <laughs> because um, they no longer have that in England. No, I, I know. <laughs> it, you know. It took a generation and it gradually, since it was never written down, it was just a matter of uh, enough people changing the convention. Getting but, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe that's it, yeah. But, but if, if you start, I mean, if you start not with the, the I, I think the politically correct move that you made to start with equity rather than with efficiency and best use, but if you start with best use, which I think was behind the, the, the English um, uh, 55 rule when, when they adopted it, uh, but if you start with best use, uh, could you not come up with an entirely different uh, allocation system, and then, then you'd have to find the ethical justification for it, but we, we could do that. I mean, we, we could work that one out. Uh, <laughs> Mark, uh, I'm sure you could. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I guess, let me give you the, the bottom line of my question, because it's sort of, I didn't know Mike was going to ask his. Bottom line of my question is, why don't we transplant everybody under the age of 50 before we transplant anybody above the age of 50? Well, you know, it's... It's, it's interesting that if you look at fair innings and don't constrain it by equal opportunity, you run out of kidneys at 39. Because if you say you should give it to the youngest person first because they have least chance of having a normal lifespan and you just go until you run out of kidneys, at least for 2010 it was 39. 39. I don't think anyone would say no one above 39 deserves a chance at a kidney. Yes. Uh, 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 and therefore, it has to be constrained in some fashion. Uh, we start with equity because I think both of us think it's important. It also happens to be the law. Uh, the final rule is a regulation. I mean, they can throw us in jail and fine our hospital and a lot of other things, but it actually isn't a law. And I do think what they were getting at in between 1984 and 2000 was the idea that we weren't using kidneys in a prudential fashion. There, I used it the way it should be used, Laney. Uh, in other words, we weren't using them sm in a smart fashion uh, because it's not going to make a world of difference. As I showed, these differences are a half year or a quarter year increased advantage over staying on dialysis, incremental increase, that is. Uh, but that's a difference, and it's especially a difference for the young person. So I think our age mapping actually gets that that. It actually gives young people kidneys that are equal at their age or younger. And it does that for everybody. So I think we actually got to a very good place. We weren't sure we were going to get there when we started out. So if I could just add on to, to what Dick just said, because I do love unintended consequences. The other thing we have to remember is that um, when you look at the young people, they get about seven, currently they get about 75% of their organs from living donors, uh, whereas somebody over 40 has about a 25% chance of getting a living donor. And I mention that because if you gave all the deceased donors to those under 39, two things either happened. 
one, nobody serves as a living donor because their loved ones got the kidney they wanted. Um, or we're going to start having the 30-year-olds giving to the 60-year-olds. And living kidneys are even better than even the best deceased donor kidney. And so if you want to talk about an inefficient system, is to increase the number of living donors going to older people. So you need to have some way of still encouraging the young person uh, for seeking out a living donor. Um, otherwise, you're going to decrease the whole pot. And remember, you know, only gets to control 60% of that pot because they don't control the living donors. I, w I would argue a little bit against Laney that the, the benefit level given here is not enough to convince anybody to wait to get a deceased donor kidney if they have a living donor. And like Mike, no, most, most fair earnings would, but no one's proposing that, except it's a straw thing to knock down. I think Mike's question says what's going to happen with the 20 year olds is those of us that are still healthy enough to give our kidneys to them will. Right. So I, it's already 10 plus after the, after the hour, and uh, so uh, obviously a very uh, interesting and controversial area that still hasn't been solved. Uh, I congratulate Dick and Laney for trying to, uh, to get something better, um, and thank you, Dick, very much for presenting it. <laughs>